Well, I've had a, a long research career at the University of Guelph in the College of Agriculture. Primarily working with pollination and pollinators. In many different environments, including, as you might imagine, in, in, agri in agricultural situations. Uh, the genus name is Chilicola, uh, Kevani, that's me. Um, and it belongs to a relatively uh, basal family of bees, so one which is fairly, uh, you know, one which has been around for a very long time. It's quite diverse, so I mean, it's not surprising to come up with a new species in the genus Chilicola or in the family to which it belongs, the Calitidae. So that's, that's not a great surprise. It's very unusual for anybody to ever find a species of mammal, which isn't already known to science, or a species of bird or reptiles. But when you get into the insect world, there are, there's just so much unknown that it is uh, a very regular occurrence for a species new to science to be discovered. In the bee world, it's a little more uh, unusual because bees are fairly well known around the world. Um, but it was one that was captured and uh, collected in Brazil um, by a colleague down there, Favizia, um, and she and I have been teaching this course together in Brazil with other colleagues from Brazil and uh, also from Argentina. A team of us get together to do it each year. And she collected this, this bee and decided that uh, in honor of my you know, activities in Brazil, she was going to call it after me. So, so that's, that's why it's got my name associated with it. So. And I'll be teaching again in Brazil, as I do every year. In, uh, in September, I, I teach a course with Brazilian colleagues um, there. So that's a great excitement that I look forward to going down to Brazil. And so all these, these are not all different bees, but as you can see from the sizes of them and the shapes, and there are a good number of different species here, um, all the way from sort of quite big uh, carpenter bees, such as this one, um, that uh, these nest in, in wood, they chew holes in wood and nest in there right the way through to some of the tiniest of, of sweat bees that um, probably, and uh, small carpenter bees, um, uh, the genus Serotina, that uh, live in the stems of things like raspberries and, uh, and currants and things like that. In the area of biovectoring, and this is a uh, this is a technology which was pioneered here at the University of Guelph to a large extent. Um, and what we do is we 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 have been able to put dispensers onto honeybee hives and also now onto bumblebee hives. And in the dispensers, we put a special mix of uh, materials which are uh, organic and uh, biocontrol agents. So, and so the bees, in going out from the hives. Uh, walk through the, this mix, this dust, and carry it out to the flowers. And then when they come back to the hive, they go in a different entrance so they don't track the stuff into the hive, so it's an efficient way of uh, delivering it. And once it's on the flowers, and this works in greenhouses and in field crops, uh, we get suppression of uh, fungal pests and at the same time suppression of insect pests. You can't really call it a pesticide in the traditional sense of the word pesticide because it is organic and they're biological agents. Mm -hmm. We have been able to extend the shelf life of strawberries uh, through this technology by suppressing the mold that gets on strawberries. We can uh, extend the shelf life by about a week. The attention which has been drawn to the importance of pollination in food production um, with the demise uh, of honeybee colonies uh, primarily in the United States, the so-called colony collapse disorder. Uh, basically, David Hackenberg, um, who's a big beekeeper in, uh, in the United States, a big commercial beekeeper, has thousands of hives, um, noted when he went into his bee yards um, that he would go in one week and the bees looked fine. He'd go in the next week and the hives would be empty. And uh, he didn't understand that. Nobody knows what's really causing it. It seems to be a multifactorial sort of thing that uh, there's a lot of different things that 
that are that people are pointing their fingers at with respect to colony collapse disorder in the United States. Well, pesticides, of course, is one of the things which has been suggested. Uh, another thing is that the bees are being kept on monocultures. So, I mean, they're put onto almonds for three weeks at a time and they don't forage on anything else. So they don't have a balanced diet. Uh, the movement and the stress that they have through being moved into pollination services uh, all these sorts of things make some sense. Then there's, uh, then there's the issue of the varroa mites, which are parasitic on honeybees and the viruses that those mites carry around with them. So, and it, who knows? Um, you know, the, certainly people who are doing diagnosis are finding the viruses, they're finding the mites, they're finding the pesticide residues, they're finding, you know, all these sorts of things are there. But in any one particular situation, it doesn't seem to be the same combination of events or uh, causes, and certainly not at, at equal intensities. So it, it seems to be a sort of thing, I sort of think of it as there's a whole bunch of stresses, and basically one of those can be the last straw that kills the camel. Um, in Canada, we haven't had the same problems. We've had uh, big problems. Uh, in some years from the demise of our bee colonies from overwintering mortality. So it have been very harsh winters and then they just don't make it through. If you talk to the beekeepers in Canada, they will say, no, we haven't got the same symptoms of die-off in Canada as in the United States. So we're not calling it colony collapse disorder in, in Canada, but still we have to watch very, very carefully because of uh, uh, winter mortality. So that's, um, I think, sort of puts it in a nutshell as what I've been doing for the last 30 years of my career. Mm -hmm.